Welcome to Influential Entrepreneurs, bringing you interviews with elite business leaders and experts, sharing tips and strategies for elevating your business to the next level. Here's your host, Mike Saunders. Hello and welcome to this episode of Influential Entrepreneurs. This is Mike Saunders with Marketing Huddle, and today we're privileged to have with us Perry Marshall, who is one of the world's most expensive and sought-after business consultants. Welcome to the program, Perry. Hey, great to be here, Mike, and thanks for having me on your show, and we're going to crack open some fun eggs today, so um, put on your crash helmets and uh, we'll... We'll dig into something, uh, probably put some money in your pocket, and it probably save you some time. Well, I love that because um, let's, uh, let's get, uh, uh, you know, you, you, you hear so many times people talk about, you know, strategies and maybe even some tactics, but then nothing gets implemented, and then what good was it? So, you know, let's see if we can come up with an actionable idea or concept or two, which I'm sure we can. So get us started off with um, what's the 80-20 rule and why should that be important to entrepreneurs? Um, well, it's the most underrated thing in business is what it is, um, and probably most people have heard about it. In fact, I was in the coffee shop the other day, and I had this 8020 shirt that one of my customers sent to me, and he goes, oh, yeah, that's like that um, 80%, 20% thing, right? And I said, well, yeah, actually, it's it's – the most all-pervasive law of cause and effect in the universe. It just happens to be most people think that it's, um, you know, this little rule of thumb that they heard about in business school. Um, but, but what it is, it, it says that, that 80% of all outcomes come from 20% of all efforts mm-hmm. and that 20% of outcomes come from the other 80% of efforts. And, and what you have to understand is this is almost universally true. It's not just 20% of your customers give you 80% of the purchase orders. It's not just 20% of the people own 80% of the wealth. It's, it's like, the size of sand, gra- sand grains if you go to the beach with a bucket. It's the traffic on the roads in your town. It's the traffic on the interstates in the United States. Like, for example, I, I forget how many interstates, like, you know, the U.S. interstate highway system. I don't know, is there 20 or 30 or 40 of them? I don't know, but 25% of all traffic is on those interstates. Mm. Okay. You know, there's millions of streets. Um, so we could be talking about the size of craters on the moon. It's true. Or if you open a window on your computer and look at the, fi- uh, the size of the files, any folder that you open, the file sizes are 80-20. 20% of the files take 80% of the space. It's true in one folder. It's true in the operating system. It's true of your, your videos that you recorded this year. It's all over the place. And, and, and I, we don't have time to go into the reasons for that, but you just have to take my word for it. It's universal. And so if you know this, and if you know that it applies to your time, it applies to your money, it applies to your customers, it applies to your vendors, you suddenly realize there's a whole bunch of waste that's going on all the time, and most people are working too hard, and most people are kind of nursing bad habits with an awful lot of extra time and energy that none of that deserves. Yeah, you know, um, I... I've said this for many years, and I think you would agree with it, it, and it plays right into the 80-20. If you want to double your business, you don't need to double the amount of clients or customers you have. You need to look at the top 20%, like the 80-20, and see which ones are super, super good and most beneficial to you, and then clone that 20%. Now, that's not exactly doubling per se, but it's going to get you a lot closer than just going, I have 100 clients now. I want to double my business. I need 200 clients. Well, you know, 80 of those clients might be, you know, eh, okay. Um, so 
I, I would say to you, I agree with that wholeheartedly. What are some tips to discovering that 20%? Because I think whoever said it, you know, uh, and I'm sure you can attribute who said this, but it's like, hey, 50% of my marketing works every single time. I just don't know which 50% it is. That's right. Well, so the, the thing about 80-20 is you usually don't know in advance um, you know, where the 20% is going to come from. But what you can be sure of is after you've done it, that it is going to be 80-20. Okay, so, so let, let me give you an example of how you can use this. So, so let's say that you know, we, we started a company this morning, which probably some of the listeners actually did because on the Internet we, we do this sort of thing. And you have a new product. And so you went and you bought some Facebook ads or some Google ads and let's say by next week we had a hundred people that gave you a hundred dollars. Okay? Because you only you had one hundred dollar product and you gotta start with something. Well, eighty twenty rule says is those customers want to spend their money eighty twenty. Twenty percent of the customers want to be eighty percent of your business. It's like a law of physics that this is true. So here's what that means. What that means is if um, next week you introduce a $400 product that's four times better than the $100 product, 20% of those customers will buy it. Mm -hmm. And 20% of them would have bought it the first time. Uh, and and you'll you'll find that this is almost scary true, and I, I call it the principle of the twenty seven hundred dollar espresso machine, <laughs> and um, it's in my book eighty twenty sales and marketing. There's a whole chapter with, with that, and and what it says is that uh, it's again pretty much as a law of physics for every one thousand people that'll buy a five dollar latte. One of them wants to spend a few thousand dollars. And at first you're like, what? Like, how do you spend a few thousand dollars on coffee? You, you buy a $2,000 stainless steel, gleaming, beautiful espresso machine. And then you put it in your kitchen, and then you go back to Starbucks the next day, and you buy another latte. Mm. That, and that, that's how it works. And, and most businesses especially like small um, you know freelancers and uh, little companies that that you know they haven't you know they don't have 70,000 items like your local grocery store usually you can increase your business by 20 or 30 percent overnight by creating an espresso machine product which is um, you know the del the super deluxe version of whatever it is that you do and the interesting thing is is your already existing customers will buy it. You don't, you don't have to get any new latte people or other kind of latte people to buy the $2,700 espresso machine. The ones that already were buying lattes, like one or two of them, they're there. And, and do you, I guess here's a, a, another thought to keep in mind, which is, with your target audience, if you roll out something that is deemed um, too low of a price, that could work against you in the sense that they now look at that product as inferior or maybe even um, if you continue doing that, your whole brand is inferior. So how do you um, guide that thought process because you don't want to be wait, you know, it's like the, um, you know, Goldilocks. You don't want to be too hot, too cold. You want to be just right. Well, you don't want to be way too expensive and you don't want to be way too cheap. So, you know, to your point about there's always going to be that one or, or so that want to buy that high end product. What do you do uh, to, to strategize that? Well, one of the things that you can do is you can start with a product that you know that most people aren't going to buy um, and then downsell after that, and mm. so, for example, if you're selling suits, if you want to sell a $3,000 suit, which is an expensive suit for, as far as most people are concerned, it's a lot easier to get the $3,000 if you start by showing them the $10,000 suit, mm. which almost nobody buys. And then all of a sudden, 
if the guy's never spent more than $1,000 on a suit before in his life, it's actually going to be a lot easier to get him to spend that because you're you're making the case. In fact, yeah. you know, I um, – in fact, one, one of my little projects to work on this summer is, you know, I've sold a number of consulting packages for over a $100,000. Um, and the thing is, is I've never made a $100,000 product that's representative of that. And I've never talked to my customers about spending the $100,000. Well, if I did, I would almost certainly get more of those $100,000 sales, but I still wouldn't get very many. But I think the biggest benefit is getting people to think, oh, well, gee, I guess those um, that those $2,000 videos uh, on Google AdWords Display Network is probably not so ridiculous considering how much money we're spending on AdWords anyway, right? Yeah. It, it just stretches it stretches people and like you always have to realize there's always that person in the crowd and the and the the money is burning a hole in the in their pocket and they will spend it somewhere. It's just a matter of whether it's with you. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> because it's kind of like the money's already flowing, how do you get in front of it and make sure that it flows directly to you, and there's a, a thousand and one ways to do that and considerations to keep in mind. So what's then the next step? Once we kind of have this 80-20 in mind and we know that there are people going to pay the higher end and we want to maximize the 20%, what's the best way to get in front of that for our business, for a, a, a traditional entrepreneur business owner? Well, the next step is elimination, and th- this is the hardest part for people. Um, you know, we all like to say, yes, we're all people pleasers. I think entrepreneurs are even more people pleasers than most people. And you kind of have to if you're going to be good at serving customers. But there's always customer, there's clients that you need to fire. Um, I did an 80-20 presentation to a whole room full of CPAs a while back. And uh, and it was, I think it was two months after tax season. And I said, so how many of you, you know, you have these pain in the butt clients and they don't really give you all that much money and, and their returns are just hideously complicated. And on top of that, they're kind of rude and impatient, like how, hands please, you know, and these hands go up and I, and I said, okay, so keep your hands up. I said, I Perry Marshall, you know, world-renowned business consultant, I give you permission to fire them. Okay? You don't have to be mean about it. You can be very cordial and diplomatic. But, you know, we we have been reevaluating our business, and we are moving in a different direction this year, and we won't be able to do your tax returns next year, and we'll hand you off to these other people, blah, blah, blah. But you get rid of them. I said, as soon as you do that, you just gave yourself a raise because – they pay you $300, but it actually costs you $1,000 to service them. So you don't, there's no law of the universe that says that they have to be your clients or that you have to do this. And this is true of vendors, and it's true of employees. I mean, I, I was sitting with a couple ladies yesterday just shooting the breeze, and, and uh Both of them are managers, uh, one at a university and the other one at some other uh, government organization. And I said, you know, you need to fire 10% of your employees every year. And they'll look at me like, really? They, They know me. They know what I do. They respect me. They're like, well, he's probably right. Why? Why do you need to do that, Perry? I said, because there's no way, there's no way that 100% of your employees actually belong there. Like all of the odds and statistics of how everything works is against it. I said, there's, you know, one out of 10 is a misfit or they used to be great and they're not anymore and they need to move on and you, you need to make that change, you know. And, she, you know, one of them's like, well, you know, what if my department doesn't give me budget to hire them back or hire new ones? And, and I said, I said the, the one that you need to get rid of is costing you more time and money than you're even paying them. If if you if you get rid of them and you lose the money from your department, your department is still ahead. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> and of course, entrepreneurs don't really have that problem. Um, it, it's it's you know sometimes having more staff just exponentially increases your headaches and and your maylocks, you know. So yeah. So. Well, here's a question on firing clients, like the CPA example. Yeah. Um, is that presupposing that you have a steady flow of potential incoming clients that are waiting in the wings that you can just replace? Because you, you, you know, my thought would be in that room, there's certainly some CPAs that would say, that sounds all fine and good, but I've only got X number of clients. If I fire 10% of them, where's that going to get replaced? Well, so it's not necessary. I am not presupposing that you are automatically replacing them. Now, I'm a marketing guy, and you can read my 8020 Sales and Marketing book, and you can get all kinds of ideas about how to get the new customers, and you should. But even if you're stagnant, I'll guarantee you that 10% of your clients, you're actually losing money servicing them. Hmm. Um, If you have any kind of fixed expenses at all, uh, or if your time is valuable at all, at the very least, it's opportunity cost. And if you have employees, it's actual money cost. So it's it's pretty much a rule of nature um, th- that that five to twenty percent of what you sell actually loses money. And if you stopped selling it your top line would go down and your bottom line would go up. That's true. Yeah, now that's a, that's a really good point too because um, y- you get the, the opportunity cost of you servicing you know, high maintenance clients if you're willing and disciplined enough to say, okay, now I don't have these. Now that chunk of time per day, week, month, whatever, I'm going to now focus that into – good, productive networking opportunities, marketing opportunities, the actual money they're costing me, whether it's an employee or, or a client, I'm going to turn that into some online productive advertising. So, yeah, I, I think that opportunity cost is, is really important. It, it, it is. And, and, again, I just need to, like, there is hard cost, and most most people are really losing Money and it, sometimes you have to do a whole cost uh, analysis to figure this out. Sometimes it's obvious and you just don't want to admit it to yourself. Uh, I think most of us know, you know, I really shouldn't be selling that product, or you know, I really shouldn't be servicing that customer. I just can't get myself. So I don't want to dwell on that too long, but it, it's really true. Yeah, so let's kind of move on and and we'll wrap up with one thought because, you know, at this point we're talking a lot of strategy and you are the godfather of Google AdWords and online advertising and we could probably spend about four and a half hours on a master class on that alone. So with that thought in mind, how do we take this strategy, this 80-20 rule concept and get in front of our true, perfect, good target audience with some good online advertising. What are one or two tips that you can recommend to make sure you avoid or to make sure that you do? Well, so Google AdWords and Facebook are the leading places that people buy traffic on the Internet, and um, most serious online businesses need to deal with at least one, if not both. And you need to understand that there is a huge, huge, gargantuan amount of waste um, in these platforms, and it's mostly by people who don't really know what they're doing. And, you know, if Google gets your 1000 bucks or your 10000 bucks, you're never getting it back, okay? Yeah. And furthermore, 90, 97... Sorry, sorry. Uh, two to three percent of the advertisers get fifty percent of the traffic. Okay, it's ridiculously quote unfair, if you will, but that's that's just the way it is. So, if you're going to do either of these platforms at all, you need to first of all figure out if they're appropriate for you. Um, I have two online quizzes. Is is if you go to isfbforme.com, 
isfbforme.com, you can take a 60-second quiz, and it'll give you a score on a scale of 1 to 10. How suitable is Facebook for you? You mm-hmm. can go to isawforme.com, is AdWords for me. And 60-second quiz, it'll say, is Google search for you? Is Google display network for you? How competitive is it? They'll tell you this information in 60 seconds. And then you, you really need to learn what you're doing. If you just throw your hat in the ring, you follow the instructions they give you, you buy some keywords, or you, know, you, you click on the easy buttons and, and advertise, you will almost certainly start losing money. In fact, it's a dead certainty you will start wasting money from the word go and anywhere from 50 to 95% of your money will be wasted. And you need to get educated on this. Um, It is a battlefield littered with dead bodies. In Mm. fact, don't even bother. If you're not willing to get trained, don't even do it because you'll get slaughtered. On the other mm-hmm. hand, if you get trained, if, if you get up to speed, you can do remarkably well, especially in smaller local markets. Like if you're a local business, I guarantee you the other pizza shops in town are not doing Google AdWords or Facebook properly. Yeah. And course, yeah, and, and it's kind of like you said, you know, there's so much waste and you just have to realize that's going to be the case. So if that is the case, you better be on top of it, watching for your metrics and watching for what you want, the results and where to tweak. And I would say that again, that's another, you know, four and a half hour masterclass of now that you know, this is the avenue you want to go. Now, how do you make sure that it performs well? So I would suspect you would recommend making sure that you are studied up, knowledgeable, or if in the case of the hypothetical CPA group you gave the presentation to, probably it's real, pretty rare that someone like that is going to bone up and study to be a PPC advertising guru and run their campaigns. So you would probably recommend there's some training courses, there's some consultants, there's some support that you would need to make sure it's being done right. Yes, and if you go take those quizzes, you know you can you can enter your email address and you can find out more about what you, what we do, but really, you, you, you have to be armed. Now, one objection that naturally comes up is, well, you know, I'm, I'm too busy to do that. Well, I, I get that, but you have to understand, um, do, buying traffic like that is as close to sitting down with your customer as you can get without sitting down with your customer. You, yeah. you gain an enormous intimate knowledge of your customers, what they want to buy, what people are searching for, um, all of that stuff. If you if you sit down and do this, and it is what I categorize as, you know, in in, eight, in the eighty twenty book, I I say there's there's three kinds of work. There's ten dollar an hour work, there's hundred dollar an hour work, and there's thousand dollar an hour work. Running pay per click is thousand dollar an hour work, and furthermore, it's very hard to hire good consultants who will really do a good job, and it's almost impossible to tell the good ones from the bad ones if you haven't done it yourself. Um, So you need to have some level of knowledge to make sure that the people that you're trying to hire even know halfway what they're talking about because you, you could be like the proverbial mechanic just giving your snow job. Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, it's, you know what it's like? It's like 10 years ago when I hired my first CPA and my first bookkeeper. They were both incompetent. And <laughs> their mistakes actually ended up costing me about $300,000. <laughs> mm. But I didn't know it until after they had made the mistakes because yep. I'm a marketing guy. I'm not a CPA. What do I know? Um, and so you get, you really got to be careful. And believe me, there's a lot of people who have wasted, like most people whose CPA blows through $300,000, they know it. Yep. But if, you, if your ad agency or your consultant is blowing through $300,000, waste in advertising is so common, most they would never know it. Uh, yeah. In fact, if, if you run a 
five million dollar company and you've been hiring people like that to do that kind of stuff, you've already wasted three hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. So it's just true. So to wrap up, to learn more, I'm, uh, I, I know your website, perrymarshall.com. You mentioned the isfbforme.com. And then what was the AdWords um, one? Isawforme.com. Awforme. If, if you, if, uh, sorry, his, isawforme.com. And, and also you can click on the 8020 link. It'll tell you, take you to our book, 8020 Sales and Marketing. It's about... 15 bucks on Amazon. You can buy it for seven, including shipping on our website, and we'll send it to you, and you will be able to see an expert sales funnel in motion when you do that. Love it. Well, Perry, thank you so much for your time. Loved uh, learning some of the high-level strategy as well as I love the concept of let's check out those quizzes, so I'll make sure that these are in the show notes for you. Excellent. Well, great to be on your show. Thank you for having me today. Thank you. You've been listening to Influential Entrepreneurs with Mike Saunders. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show or listen to past episodes, visit www.influentialentrepreneursradio.com.